In this video I'm going to be looking at the results I got from putting a new film into my 40 year old Olympus OM-1N camera. Join me. YouTube, Brian James at Micro Four Thirds Guy with you once again and again not a Micro Four Thirds camera but back to the Olympus OM-1N that I found. Now just to bring you up on the story in case you haven't seen them and there's a link to the uh, original video above. The Olympus OM-1N was my first um, decent single lens reflex camera which I bought way back in 1980 um, so it's now 41 years old um, and I bought it used it for a long time professionally and as an amateur and eventually superseded with all sorts of other things and it, I discovered in my garage uh, a few months ago. Decided to get it out, realised there was still a film in and shot through that film, decided to try and see what was on it and there's, again there's a vid video to see what I actually found on that 20 year old film and to see if it came out or not. But it, one of the things I wanted to do was put a, a new film through and see how that came out. And that's just what I've done. Problems, there's always problems along the route. First of all, it was a 400 ASA film. Trying to get new film these days is really, really difficult. Um, so the only choice I had was either black and white film, which I love black and white, but I wanted to shoot colour on this occasion, or a 400 ASA Fuji uh, extra film, which was a good, it's a good film, but 400 was a little bit more than I really wanted to go speed-wise. And obviously there's a grain implement, a grain element comes into it at 400 ASA. But I took it anyway, put it in the camera, and let's have a look at some of the results. Now before we go on, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, there's a subscribe button down below. It's now grey, not red, so just hit that if you haven't, and that'll uh, subscribe to the channel. And you can come and join our merry clan of um, like-minded people. Great to see you all. The other thing is hit the notification bell, that'll give you notifications every time I upload a new video. And if you feel inclined, give it a thumbs up because that helps by YouTube using its algorithms to spread these, these videos to more people. So let's have a little look what we've got on the, on the films. And keep watching because you'll find that as developments come as to how the camera actually improves, how I can get better results out of it. So keep watching as we go through the films. This was very much an ongoing experiment. I'm not going to take you through all the photographs, but I'll start off with these couple. And basically these two uh, first shots, they were me loading the film in the camera. Now for you younger people who've never seen what a real film camera looks like as opposed to a digital camera, uh, that sounds condescending, but it's probably true. Um, there's... You pull the film across and the first couple of shots on the film are where you've actually had it exposed to light and they're wasted somewhat. So you tend to take it through two or three shots until you get to the number one counter on the camera itself. I always point the camera at something. I've actually had useful shots where I shouldn't have in the past. Uh, on that, on the, the, the one pre, the, the very first shot that you should have. And why you wind it on that many times is it means that you, you've taken all the unexposed film out. Get it on the right hand spool before you take your first shot. So on these, just a couple of uh, pictures of the ball on there. Interesting to see, obviously these were exposed to light because you can see the streaks down the left hand side and, and that's fine. But even then, it was interesting to see that without any real trying to do the metering, um, it, it, they came out. And how I was doing the metering on these, because the uh, OM-1N used a mercury battery, which are now illegal to, to use, the, the, the current replacement has ever so slightly different voltage. And what that does, because it's literally a voltage measurement for the light coming in um, to what's metered, you have your, IC, your ASA adjuster, which is your film speed, equivalent to ISO on digital cameras. But that, all that's doing is just changing a centre point on the metering. So when you set the 400 ASA, it's setting the centre point and then it's looking at the metering to try and tell you when you're exposed correctly under ex or overexposed on the uh, shutter speed and the aperture. So the workaround, you can actually get the cameras recalibrated, but the trouble with a 40 year old camera like this, the second hand value is almost nothing in, in real terms. So it would cost you considerably more than the camera to send it in to be serviced and recalibrated. So the easiest way is just to try and find out how much it is out down to the, with the 
battery voltage and adjust the ASA slightly on that. So this was a bit of an experiment and what I did for the experiment I used um, one of my digital cameras with a 25mm lens on. I was using the Olympus with a 50mm because it's effectively a full frame camera being a 35mm camera. So I was using the 50mm on that. That has an approximate angle of view to the 25mm on the Micro Four Thirds and I was using the Micro Four Thirds with an average metering just to try and uh, get that so pointed at the subject get a light metering with the camera the digital camera set to 400 ISO I had 400 ISO film inside the film camera and what I did is I worked out what the aperture and shutter speed should be of that that worked reasonably well but it was very very messy and what I then did is uh, I took a few shots we'll see first one I really took was a sort of stone obelisk at Bits Park in Carlisle these were all Carlisle and the problem as well is that wouldn't you just know we've had poor weather in, in Cumbria for ages and the very time I get a 400 ESA film I get some of the brightest days of, of, the, of the year up to now and it went on for days and days so I really was battling against the elements. The Stone Obelisk at Bits Park I again there's a certain amount of light has gone through into this one um, and I didn't know if it was just that this was the first one on the on the shutter or not but it seems overexposed um, again this was trying to best guess the, the metering on this so I, I could have put it down to that but the next shot that we have or the next two shots are of this tree which again are in Bits Park and again we can see that there is light bleeding through on the, the left hand side of both of these shots this worries me a little bit because it means that possibly the light seals are uh, somewhat shot in the camera or the camera door may have um, may not be sitting properly closed and again it's been sat for a long time, it's been sat for 20 years so it wouldn't really surprise me. The next shot that I did is um, being pulled up on Lightroom and basically what I've done on all these photographs I've put them in the Lightroom and just tried to get the exposure uh, according to what Lightroom says on its auto setting to, to be right. And this been, has been given a, a good indication because obviously if, if Lightroom is having to bring it in by two or three stops then that's how far we were out in, originally. Um, if it's a very small amount that Lightroom is just an exposure, then we're probably just about spot on. Now these first couple of shots weren't too bad, but this one was deliberately shot against a, a, a bright sky, a bright backlit thing. What I wanted to do on this was deliberately to be able to see it in post-production and see what we could draw by hitting the shadows up and really pulling it out on there. And it's, it's worked fairly well. The original photograph from this was just literally um, a black silhouette. So it really has pulled it out fairly well and it's, it's, it's good on that. Now the other thing is as well, none of these are artistic shots. They weren't intended to be. So, you know, if I say, well, could you have taken this from a different angle? That wasn't really what, well, wasn't really what I was intending on this. I wanted to see things like some detail. I wanted to see colours. I wanted to see exposure. And in reality, um, to try and get those so that I could you have a useful measure in my own mind, I really needed some rather bland shots. So these are pretty bland shots, but useful all the same for what I'm doing on this. The next few shots um, are a flower bed in Bits Park. And the reason I went for this one is because it really is a good mismatch of colours. There's lots of detail in there. It's very, very messy, which is great. And there's also quite a bit of depth of field in that as well. Now, one of the problems I had in doing this, as I say, it was a 400 SA film on a really bright day. The camera has limitations. The lens only goes down to f16 and the shutter speed, the maximum shutter speed on the Olympus OM 1N is 1 1,000th of a second. Now when we're used to the idea of adjusting cameras up to an 8,000th of a second on some of the uh, Micro Four Thirds cameras that I'm used to, that really is something a limitation. And remember, on a modern camera we can change the ISO in between shots if we want to. On this we're stuck at 400 for all 36 exposures so we don't have a choice and this is going back to the old days that we had this is the some of the limitations that we had nothing on the camera is automated so everything is done manually focus aperture shutter speed and all the judgments are done there so and on this one the as i say the um the exposure wasn't even usable in the meter what I did discover when I was doing these, I looked at my mobile phone and on my iPhone there was a, I found an app which used the camera inside the iPhone to give details 
of the exposure. It became an exposure meter on my phone. And I found that much, much easier to use than trying to point a second camera. So over the next couple of shots, I did the two together um, and found that there was a discrepancy against them. Um, but I, I found that the, the mobile phone gave me a little bit more consistent as an exposure meter. Obviously, the camera is doing it very, very accurately for what it does. The other thing I really found was a problem was modern cameras, um, you're talking about one third of a stop adjustments. The Olympus, you're on one stop adjustments. If you go between the shutter speeds, you're going between 60th, 125, 250th, 500,000th. So everyone is a one stop difference on it. And the same on the lens. So we've become very, very used to acute uh, accuracy on uh, exposure metering inside cameras so I knew I was never going to get it spot on but I was also hoping that the, that the film had a bigger latitude and from what I remembered about using the film from years ago it does seem to have a very wide up latitude insofar as what it can do so let's have a look at these couple um, again mainly flowers there's lots of detail on that but if you look at the trees up in the top left hand corner and right hand corner the greens, it's a very distinct sort of green, and I haven't seen this sort of look and feel for a long time. Now, there's no white balance adjustment, obviously, on a film. This is set up uh, for reasonably cloudy days because it's 400 ASA film, and this was a particularly bright day. So we're going to have a white balance difference anyway, and that should have hopefully been taken up in some of the processing. However, not always. And also... We talk about colour science in cameras now. Well, each film type had its own colour science, if you like, its own signature look. And people look towards things like ectochrome and things like that from the, the 50s and 60s and the, the, with a, um, a, a nostalgic air about them. Well, again, this is the fact that you have a chemical reaction. It doesn't record it ideally exactly, but it does give its own cast and its own feel to it. And that's what I'm reading into this. The greens are something I can't achieve on my digital camera. And... Some of the thing I'm thinking is that um, digital cameras tend to have more green sensors than the others, than the, the red and blues inside them. So the green be can become dominant. And one of the things I've looked at on shots recently on my uh, digital cameras is the intensity of the greens. These are very subdued, almost blackened, uh, rather than the, the brightness of the, the, the greens I'm getting. But the rest of the colours are really there. They're really nice and strong and vibrant, which is great, especially the reds and pinks. Uh, there's a great deal of detail, but when you pixel peep in, it is very soft. Now, I took these, I only got these done on a standard um, resolution. I'm just going to try and find out what the resolution was. It was about two, about two and a half thousand along its long edge. So, two and a half thousand pixels along its long edge. So, not the highest resolution, but also not the weakest. But it... The softness wasn't there because of a uh, because of pixelation. The softness was there in the uh, the original photograph, but what I am finding is it still had a lot of detail in that, and detail and sharpness don't necessarily go hand in hand. We think of them as being together, but you can get great detail out of something and still have a less than pin sharp image, and I think we've become to a degree very um, fixated on super sharpness these days with what's available. Um, and we forget that some of the, the best photographs and some of the best cameras weren't as pin sharp as they are today. So we've got these three. Um, the, the last one obviously with the great intensity of reds there is, is, is fascinating. Then I took one of the park bench. Again, very strong sunlight. We can see by the hard edge on the shadows it was a very hard light on this day. Not the best conditions for this. But again, the casting has, has come out really well. The black is very, very good. Um, it's one of the things that I do find can be a bit of a limitation on some digital cameras is the way that they rendition black. Um, and the black on this has come out really well. I then went in for a couple of close-up shots where the, I saw an insect on the plants. And again, the highlights on this are really intense because of the strong sunlight. Um, but again, those greens, those greens are what, I used, what I'm used to seeing on digital cameras these days. They are a slight difference on that. I then took some more around Carlisle with the castle itself and the town centre. And again, I was starting to notice that I had light, either an overexposure or light coming in. And I wasn't too sure on, on these. And of course, you don't find these out until 
a week or so after you've taken them because you have to have the film developed and processed. But going on to things like the castle itself, if I look at these two for the castle, I did find that they were very, very good. The colour of the brick and the colour of the grass is actually very good. And one of the problems that we have as as humans, we, we interpret things. We, we, we look at something and we have an auto-processing thing. Very much our camera would auto-process a JPEG from the raw image. We do that with our own eyes. When we look at something, we'll build colour intensity in, which isn't necessarily there, to have a pleasing view. And it's quite often the case that when you start describing between two people, they'll see the same thing ever slightly different. Um, but when you try and be objective on the colours and go back to it, the colours which are on these are pretty good. The intensity is, is, is pretty good. I'm overall re really happy. And this was being taken off the, um, the, the exposure meter on the phone. Now what I was also doing is experiment with the ISO knob and I've got it so that with a 400 SA film I found that the closest meterings I got were on were if you change the knob to 125. So we're talking um, about a stop and a half, um, maybe two stops difference between the uh, between reality and what the meter is set to with this mercury with the non-mercury battery in. So I left the meter on 125 and I started using the meter itself just in the camera. Um, once I got reasonably confident with that. Now again, you don't know until these come back, so I could have ended up with a film full of totally overexposed f uh, photographs, or totally underexposed ones. As it is, I think it's slightly overexposing by maybe half a stop on, on some of these, but we can get around that. Um, we now know since we've seen the end results. But as I say, the ones of the castle, great. The, the the light, the vertical light here, uh, a great deal of detail on that, um, and the blues in the skies are really is really nice and intense too. Going into the centre of town, very very good again, and look, again with the greens, um, there is a, a certain feel to them, which is which is unusual and strange. There's one outside the town hall of the cafe here. Um, Again, the colours are very good, except for that post box. That post box is just so intense in this red. And it's, again, that intensity of red, I don't expect to see on digital cameras. Yet on a film camera, it really stands out. Um, and again, I think a little bit of exposure may change that. But I also do feel that there is a white balance problem on this. And I do, again, think it's down to the fact that it's a cloud-based film rather than a bright sunlight film. Um, there seems to be a slight bluish edge to it, which would su suggest... Um, that the, the light, the colour temperature was towards the, the the hotter side of the scale. Going out to uh, the River Eden and the church out there, Warwick Bridge, and again, there's, a, there's certainly a colour cast on these. That I haven't quite sussed out in my mind as to what's wrong with these colour wise, but there certainly is. Um, insofar as compared to taking it with digital but again I'm trying to think of what it was actually like on the day and is this just to do with a, with a colour temperature problem or not some of the church again the detail is superb um, but still there's a softness there um, and looking back through some of my photographs from previous times that softness has always been there that's what we used to have and again I think it's a perception difference but by the time I got to the end of this part about the church, um, I realised that I had a problem, especially this one with the, the graveyard and the side view of the church. I was starting to get light leakage again, and this is rather worrying because I hadn't had it on previous ones particularly. But again, a big streak. Now, I know the door didn't come open accidentally. There was nothing like that happened. But definite streaks, and I'm wondering maybe if there is something pushing the door slightly apart and allowing just that little bit of light in, or if there is a seal which is, you know, if I've been hand-holding it for a long time, it's holding the door shut, but because I put the, the camera down, maybe that's allowed light in. A little bit worrying, and again, to get that repaired is going to be more than the value of the camera. Another one, the light on the church, again, came out okay, but then back to one of the Eden, and another light leakage through. But the very next shot of the, the vicarage, perfect there's nothing wrong with it again slight maybe slightly overexposed but I'm aware of that now so I'm not too worried about it so I fulfilled my, fil my filming for that day and I had a few shots left I was desperately waiting for a cloudy day rather than sunshine it just didn't seem right to just take photographs in the bright sunshine with that particular film and 
just the other day we got that opportunity the sun managed to settle itself down a bit we've got a more overcast day and I went back into Carlisle the Bits Park again and took this and again I expected the greens to be different with the colour with the white balance white uh, with the colour temperature I actually don't think now looking at these that it was the colour temperature now what do you think before I go on to the next few what do you think about what you've seen up to now leave me a comment below I'm really interested to hear these because I'm not trying to be any expert on this uh, these are literally what I've pulled out the camera I'm, I'm looking on the screen beside me at them as we talk the these are literally what I've pulled out of the camera and um, there are I'm trying to rekindle some of the memories of photography from yesteryear and put it into the context of what I'm doing now on digital photography but some of these colour casts and colour balances I think were there at the time and I think that's what we we just used to at the time as well and I think it was quite accepted now I think we have um, an awful lot more adjustability built into the camera and, the, and I think technology has gone certainly forward insofar as lens and camera design insofar as accuracy of focus and all sorts of things there were some really good vintage lenses but again vintage lenses had a certain look and feel to them so let's have a look at this one this is our dull day and we are here with there's an abandoned house in in the middle of Bits Park in Carlisle but again the greens of that same sort of color cast on it um, the brickwork comes out there's detail but again the softness Going to the next shot, back to that tree again, and that again, although this time we don't have the colour streaks, the, the light streaks through like we had last time, but again there's a sort of washed out feel, a dark washed out feel to the greens. It doesn't have a vibrance, but the, the darker colour tree to the right of it is actually just about spot on for what the tree looks like in real life. So it's not too far off being accurate, but it just seems that there's a, a certain feel to those greens. Again, going to the side view of the castle and the car park. Um, similar thing with the greens, but a similar get thing again with the detail in the bricks of the castle. And it quite clearly to see, clear to see, but very soft still. I then swung round quickly, literally quickly, and didn't have time to do much apart from just grab um, the shutter speed and try and get the, the needle in the centre as, as quick as possible to take a photograph of this bus. And I, I was absolutely astounded when I saw this come out. I thought this was going to be a horrible mess. came out really, really good. Lots of detail on there, including the sign for Bits Park there. And also, if you were to um, pixel peep into the um, bus sign, you can see each of the LEDs, which is mainly up. But when you pixel peep in, it's quite soft. So, you pay your money, takes your choice. So, overall, what's my conclusions? Well, it's been an interesting experiment, but I don't think I would be comfortable using this camera now. I think it needs some repair work to stop the light source, the light leakages coming in. You wouldn't dare do a shoot on it because you wouldn't be able to guarantee that the photographs you're taking are going to come out. And that's the sad part of this. But it is um, a 40-year-old camera with 55-year-old, 50, 55-year-old technology. It's about 50, yeah, 50-year-old technology in it. Um, so it, it it is a camera which is um, it's it's certainly earned its place. It's certainly paid for itself over the years. I think I paid one hundred and twenty five pounds for it, which is a fortune in nineteen eighty. Um, but at the same time, it's really paid for itself. It's um, it's been a, a good piece of kit. I think it probably deserves to sit where it is. In fact, it's not there at the moment. I've taken it down, but it certainly deserves to be up on the shelf behind me, amongst the things that I keep and don't just get rid of as as junk because it's got a, a great sentimental value but as a, a photography tool I think that particular camera has probably passed it insofar as the Olympus OM-1N I would say that if you have one um, go out and use it and try it and keep on taking photographs because photographs do have a different look and feel we've seen it in here um, but that's my take on it I, I had a thoroughly wonderful experience doing so. The next one I'm going to be doing will be the Pentax ME which is the camera that uh, my daughter found and again I'm going to be running a film through that but the results of the film from that one that we that we found in it again suggest they've been there quite a long time and there may be a light leakage in with them. We'll have to see how it goes. My name is Brian James, I'm the Micro Four Thirds guy don't forget to subscribe to um, to hit the notify button give me a big thumbs up if you would appreciate that one and if you've enjoyed this or any of the other videos um, if you want to help support me the film for instance on this cost me eight pounds the uh, the the processing cost me nine pounds and of course there's all the fuel going out to do it 
so if you can support me in any of the costs on that, I really would appreciate it. There's a PayPal link below if you want to if you want to help support the channel on that. Anything that you can that you can spare into that is gratefully accepted. Don't forget, if you're going out, take a camera with you, whether it's a digital or a film camera, just make sure you're out there taking photographs and enjoying the process of doing so. Thanks very much. See you next time. Bye bye. Thank you.